I press the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 1, page 96. Once again, I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome. Yes, thanks for joining us. Today we've got a short story for you. How the Tooth Fairy, like, totally scammed the boogeyman by Derek J. Goodman. Derek J. Goodman is a young writer currently living in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Don't you know? (laughs) Originally, he attended the Colorado Institute of Art, but left when he decided that writing was his true calling. His fiction has appeared in publications such as Glass Fire Magazine, Revolution Sci-Fi, Gods and Monsters, and new writings in the fantastic. With a story slated to appear in the New Year's anthology, Best New Tales of the Apocalypse. How the Tooth Fairy Like Totally Scammed the Boogeyman by Derek J. Goodman Clay rolled off Lisa and some of the hundred dollar bills that had been strewn all across the bed stuck to his sweaty back. Having sex on top of all the money they had just ripped off had been Lisa's idea. And while it had seemed like a good idea in the moment, Clay hadn't realized just how uncomfortable it would be. He also did not relish the idea of trying to spend it and trying to explain why the bills were covered in sweat and cum stains. Lisa, however, did not seem to care about whether or not it was comfortable. Nor did she look like she was thinking of spending it. Instead, she cooed softly, her eyes closed and her face still flushed after her orgasm, and picked up a handful of bills to rub against her chest. Oh, that was great. She said. That was like so great, you know? Clay pushed a small stack of bills out of his way, not paying them any mind as they flittered to the floor, and closed his eyes as the post-sex drowsiness prepared to take him. Yeah, you were good too. Lisa lightly smacked him in the stomach and belched out her familiar annoying donkey bray of a laugh. I meant the con, silly. That was so totally much awesomer than anything else we've done. Clay opened his eyes and looked over at her, not sure whether to thank God that he had given Clay such an easy-to-please partner or curse him for forcing her into Clay's life. She knew so little about grifting that he had to hold her hand through almost every stage of their plans, and she had not yet figured out just how tired and worn Clay's particular act was. Today's scam had been just a variation of the pigeon drop, one that they had actually managed to screw up royally, and if their mark, a fat old man with a scraggly white beard and some strange northern-sounding accent, had not been so incredibly naive, they would have surely been busted. It was only by luck that they had been able to get away with it. The size of their haul today went a small way towards making Clay feel better about it, but he knew his pride would not let him enjoy the moment for much longer. And yet Lisa did not seem to understand how close they had come to screwing up. She lay on her side smiling at him, a smile that he had always felt was vaguely disturbing with her impossibly white and strangely large teeth showing between her lips, and she looked absolutely pleased with herself. When he had first met her, he had intended to make her yet another of his many marks, but she had proven to be occasionally smarter than her valley girl way of talking would have implied. She was just smart enough that she did not usually make a mess of things, but not so much that she thought she could run any of the scams without him. Hey, maybe we should take a break for a bit, Clay said. We have enough money to live nicely for a while. Lisa's mouth dropped open at what he was saying. He wished she wouldn't do that. Her teeth somehow managed to look even larger with her mouth open, and it gave her a strange, slightly inhuman look. It even looked like she had more teeth than she was supposed to have. No way, dude. We're just getting really good. Clay had to keep from snorting. Lisa did not notice. And I know exactly who we should scam next. This time, Clay was unable to keep from audibly groaning. Lisa, I know how much you're starting to like all this, but I don't really think you're ready to come up with cons by yourself. 
No, listen, all right? This is totally a great idea. She started to say something else, then paused and looked thoughtful for a moment. Then she shook her head. No, maybe not. I don't think you're ready for him yet. He's totally out of your league. Clay raised an eyebrow, but Lisa did not seem to realize the irony of her own statement. She sat up on the bed, brushed away several of the bills that stuck to her. She missed several that still clung to her back, but the sight was too amusing for Clay, and he didn't say anything, and gave him a smile, the more pleasant kind with her mouth closed. I'm going to take a shower, and then we can, like, go spend some of this. Maybe a nice dinner? I'm starving. Do you know how long it's been since I've had good Italian? Probably not since, like, a month ago when... Her string of babble continued all the way to the bathroom, but Clay had stopped listening by that point. Sometimes she could be so annoying that he just wanted to shoot her, but she had proven herself at least semi-competent. Maybe it was time to have her prove herself, perhaps give her a little test. He had no intention of staying with her forever. There was even a small possibility that at some point he would have to kill her as he had his last partners. If he was going to keep her around for now, however, then she had to show that she had some ability to think on her feet. He got up from the bed, brushed a few bills from his own body, and went to the bathroom door. Hey, Lisa, hold up, he said as he opened it. Why don't you tell me more about this, um, guy? They both stood there for several seconds staring, Clay with his hand still on the doorknob, and Lisa paused in the process of trying to shake off the hundred dollar bills that were still stuck to her wings. Her wings? The words just kept repeating over and over in his mind. Lisa had wings. They were shimmery and translucent things, vaguely resembling those of a dragonfly except for the fact that they were each somewhere around three feet long. As Clay watched, the last bill slipped free and fluttered to the floor. I guess I should, like, try explaining. Lisa said. Yeah. Clay said. I guess you, like, should. So, Lisa was the tooth fairy. Clay would have been lying if he had said that the revelation did not blow his mind, but it went a ways to explaining why Lisa could be so freakish. They sat on the bed, the money now swept to the floor and forgotten, and Lisa laid out the whole truth for him. He had forced her to let him take a closer look at the wings just to make sure this was not part of some strange new con, but the wings were firmly attached to her back and flapped gently when she flexed a few unidentifiable muscles over her shoulder blades. Well, but they weren't there just a few minutes ago, he said. How the hell can you just make them disappear? You know, like as Yules have- Wait, what the fuck is a Yule? You know, Yules, as in U-L, urban legends. So anyways, us Yules have access to certain magics. Kind of like, what do you call them? Glamours? Illusions? That sort of thing. You'd be surprised what we can look like when we want to blend in. So there's more things like you, um, Yules, out there? Yep, there's a couple of us around. Actually, that's totally what I was going to tell you a few minutes ago, but I like, I don't know, chickened out. There's a certain Yule I've been wanting to screw over since I hooked up with you. Hold up, just one revelation at a time. I'm still trying to get over the fact that this whole time I've been fucking and pulling cons with the Tooth Fairy. He ran a hand through his hair, then stood up from the bed and began pulling his clothes on. It was something to do. Something to keep his hands occupied while he tried to process this all. Lisa smiled, all her teeth gleaming, and Clay suddenly had to wonder just how many of those were hers, and how many had once belonged to other people. After all, she had to do something with all those teeth, didn't she? Of course you've been pulling cons with the Tooth Fairy. Like, why do you think I'm hardly ever around at night? I'm out doing my other job. I I just figured you had a thing for late night cafes or something. So you call this... Um, other thing you do a job. Why not just make money doing that? How the hell am I supposed to make money when my job forces me to give it all away? All that money you put under the Rugrats pillows has to come from somewhere. Besides, I don't really need to sleep, and I get bored during all that extra time. The other Yules do, too. I hear that Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny actually think they're superheroes and go around fighting evildoers or something. But I don't want to do that kind of thing. It's no fun. But this... She gestured at him, at the bed, at the money. This is fun. Clay finished pulling on a t-shirt and sat back down next to Lisa. She had not bothered to put any clothes back on yet. Not that a shirt or bra would have even fit with her wings still out. And he had to admit the whole naked fairy thing was really sexy. 
The only problem was, now that she was apparently in her true form, she smelled disturbingly like toothpaste. That might get just as annoying to him as her laugh or smile. He wondered idly if she was immortal or if he would still be able to kill her at some later date if he had to. But that was a problem for some other time. Right now, he wanted to know just where the hell she was going with this. So? Give it to me already. Who is it you want to scam? He was not entirely surprised when she said it was the boogeyman. After almost five hours of working out the details, not including the half hour in which they took a break for sex, they finally had their plans worked out. The basis of it was a classic romance scam. Lisa said the boogeyman was the lonely type, but Clay had to take her word for it. With parts of the dar and the fiddle game thrown in to sweeten the payoff. By the time they were finished, Clay had to admit it was all a pretty good scam. Or at least, it would have been if they were going after anyone other than the boogeyman. He had never actually believed in the boogeyman as a kid. With two drunken parents to worry about, he had not had time for the figments of other children's imaginations. His complete lack of any familiarity with the boogeyman was a concern for him, since he didn't like going after a mark without at least some background to work with. Lisa insisted she knew enough about him, though, even if she was not telling Clay too much. Lisa insisted that the boogeyman had more than enough money to make the small dangers in the plan worthwhile. But from her hints, Clay thought that when he was not scaring little kids in the dark, the boogeyman might be somehow involved in the drug trade. A supernatural drug dealer did not seem like the sort of person Clay wanted to cross. The question, then, was whether or not Lisa's plan was sturdy enough. There were a lot of X factors, more than Clay liked, and he was still on the fence about whether or not she had the brain capacity to pull this off. As he pulled his own clothes back on again, he watched her get into her own. He had insisted that she keep her wings out when they had had sex that second time, and he found the whole fairy thing strangely erotic. As she started to slip her bra on, the wings began to shrink, and after about ten seconds they were completely gone, even the odd muscle structure in her back. She finished hooking the bra, saw that he was staring at her, and smiled. You're kind of freaking out right now, aren't you? No. Why do you say that? Because you've got this, like, deer-in-the-headlights look right now. Just be cool, all right? I know what I'm doing. Her smile widened. She may have been able to hide her wings, but she either could not or would not hide the strange number of teeth in her mouth. This was a woman who had magic on her side, he reminded himself. She could make sure that things went smoothly. Then he thought about how badly the earlier con with the old man had almost gone. Maybe this was not the best decision he had ever made in his life. But he just had to go through with it. Now that he had seen part of Lisa's strange world, he just had to see more. So if we're supposed to approach the boogeyman in order to make our initial fake offer, Clay said, where are we supposed to go find him? Lisa, who had been putting all the money back into the briefcase they had kept it in, looked up from her task and rolled her eyes. Duh, like the closet? Right, of course. He crossed the bedroom and opened the closet door. This place they were staying was only supposed to be temporary, so neither of them had actually hung up any clothes or stored anything in it yet. Other than the fact that it was empty, there was nothing remarkable about it. And just how the hell is that supposed to work? Just relax. We enter the closet with the idea of seeing him and we'll just, like, appear in his domain. I've done it before. What, you just sometimes decide to visit the boogeyman for the hell of it? Well, not so much the boogeyman. You never really know what he's going to do, so I like usually avoid him and stuff. But as Yules, you'd be surprised how well some of us know each other and just hang out. I even once had an affair with the jackalope. Wait, you had sex with a rabbit? Lisa, that's a little on the disgusting side. Lisa smiled. If you knew more about me, you probably wouldn't say that. She closed the briefcase and set it next to the bedroom door. Okay. Let's do this while well, I'm still totally psyched about it. Don't want to lose my nerve. She joined him next to the closet and gestured for him to go in. He hesitated, but not for as long as he would have expected himself to, then stepped in with Lisa close behind him. It was not an especially large closet, and he and Lisa had to squeeze together to both fit. This is cozy, Clay said. You know, this is kind of making me horny again. You won't be horny in a second. Trust me, this is going to be, like, totally unpleasant. 
She closed the door and everything went dark except for a thin strip of light coming from underneath the bottom of the door. And then... Nothing happened. Elisa, maybe we're not doing this right. Shh. Lisa said, and as Clay's eyes adjusted to the dimness, he could start to see that her own eyes were closed tight like she was concentrating. So he waited, and soon he realized that by tiny increments, the light under the door was fading. Yet it was somehow becoming easier to see. The walls around them felt like they were slowly moving away, making the space less cramped with each passing second. He looked around, expecting to be able to see the walls as his vision got better, but he could see nothing other than Lisa. There was a distant sound like wind blowing, but he could not feel any wind against his skin. Everything had suddenly become much colder, and Clay's arms started to break out in goose flesh. We're here, Lisa whispered. Her voice was reverent, like they were in a church or some sort of sacred place. She opened her eyes and then nodded at some place behind Clay. And so was he. He turned and the sight in front of him gave him a strange shiver down his spine. A tattered and faded black cloak hung in front of him, as if it were suspended from invisible wires. There were no feet poking out from beneath the frayed cloth, and the space underneath the cloak's hood, where a face should have been, was instead just occupied by a void. Even if it had no legs and no face, though, the thing certainly had hands. Three long ivory claws on each with thick, inflamed-looking joints, and just a hint of coarse, black hair starting at the wrists. Clay's heart sped up, and it suddenly occurred to him that maybe this had not been such a good idea. Lisa? He began, not sure if he was just looking for reassurance or was about to suggest they just call it off, but she patted him on the shoulder and shook her head. Don't worry. I got it. She took a step closer to the boogeyman, gently pulling him along with her by the arm. Hey, boogie. It's been a while. Something has come up this, like, really sweet deal, and it totally made me think of you. How would you like to... One clawed hand shot out, grabbed Lisa by the throat, and twisted. Clay heard the bones in her neck snap, and her eyes instantly glazed over. The boogeyman tossed her limp body aside, and she landed several feet away on the darkness. Her head was at a right angle to her body and her lips were pulled back in what was either a permanent attempt at a scream or an eternally toothy smile. I guess that answers the question of whether or not she can be killed, he thought. Then he pissed his pants. His first instinct was that he should turn and run, even though he had no idea where the hell he intended to run in this place. But before he could move, the thing had already grabbed him by the throat. Clay waited for the moment when his own neck would be twisted into new and unnatural angles. But instead, the thing picked him up and held him directly in front of where its face should have been. Did you really think I would fall for any sort of trick? The boogeyman said in a scratchy hiss. Even if it did not have a mouth, Clay could still smell its breath, like stagnant swamp water. I know about evil deeds. I know when someone has been bad and when someone has been good. And you, my piss-smelling friend, have been very very bad. Please, Clay said, his heart racing, and he could barely breathe with the thing's vice-like grip around his throat, but he had to get the words out in as calm a manner as possible if he wanted to get out of this. I'm not really a bad person. Just just let me go. Oh, yes, you are. And you are going to admit it. If I have to torture you, make you scream in beautiful, absolute agony. You are going to admit it. He briefly tried to imagine what sort of horrible things the boogeyman might be capable of doing to him, then realized what a bad idea that was. No, please don't. I'll do anything. Just don't hurt me. Admit it then. Admit what you have done. Admit everything you have done. Clay did. He admitted his first cons. He admitted to everything he had ever stolen. He admitted to killing his last partner. He admitted to the things he had promised himself he would never tell anyone in his life. Things that would put him in prison for life. It was not until he was finished, when the last of his nasty deeds was out in the open, that he realized he was crying. He was a horrible, despicable person. And there was no way he would ever be able to deny that to himself or anybody. The boogeyman's grip tightened momentarily, and Clay was certain that this was it that this was his end, and he closed his eyes. After several seconds, the end still had not come, and Clay cautiously opened one eye. 
It was hard for him to tell with just empty space under the hood, but the boogeyman had taken up a posture that might have been thoughtful and considering. What do you think? The boogeyman said, and now his voice was softer, gentler, almost jovial. Is he telling us everything? Oh, yeah. Lisa's voice said. Clay tried to turn his head and look at her. Make sure he was not just hearing things, but the boogeyman's grip remained tight. That's definitely everything. That was when Clay blacked out. Clay woke back up in the bedroom wearing nothing but his boxer shorts and two pairs of handcuffs. One around his wrists and one around his ankles. He still smelled like his own urine. He blinked several times, moved around a little just to make sure that he was still alive and intact, and looked around the room in an attempt to see what was going on. Lisa stood there smiling down at him with her hands on her hips, the briefcase full of money sitting next to her. Her neck was back to its proper shape, yet he thought that maybe her teeth had changed. There now seemed to be the proper number in her mouth, but the front two still looked overly large. Behind her, and to one side, stood the boogeyman. But he too had gone through a change. Or rather, he was still going through a change. The black cloak was shortening and brightening to a reddish color. And a proper face now replaced the blank spot. It was even a face that Clay knew. Although it took him several moments to remember from where. This had been the same guy they had scammed earlier in the day. As Clay watched, he became fatter and started to grow a long white beard. What the hell is this? Clay asked. This is you getting exactly what you deserve, Lisa said. We've already called the cops. They'll be here soon. And not only will they find you when they get here, they'll also find this. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a tape recorder. She hit the play button and Clay heard his own sobbing voice confessing to everything bad that he had ever done. You can't just turn me in and think I won't give you up, too, Clay said. You were just as involved in all our cons as I was. Sure, except every time we were actually just conning my friend here. The fat man stepped forward and nodded. His hood had by now turned into a red hat with a white tassel, and his belly shook as he laughed quietly to himself. The two of us have been working together to catch you for a long time, and this tape, along with a few other things we've left for the cops, is going to be just enough to put you away for a long time. She stopped to pick up the case of money, and as she did so, something seemed to be changing about her skin. It seemed to be growing softer, like she was covered in a fine fur. It even seemed to be turning bright pink. So, wait, Clay said. Does this mean you're not really the Tooth Fairy? Of course not, she said. I would have never been able to trick you into sleeping with me if you'd known what I really was. She turned and escorted her old friend to the door. As they were leaving, Clay could see what looked like a soft cottontail poking out the back of her pants. Author's note. This story was inspired by the painting Lisa and Clay, The Tooth Fairy and the Boogeyman by Dennis Brown. In the painting, Lisa has a tiara and a wand, as well as a huge toothy smile. She almost appears to be dancing. Behind her is Clay, a hulking figure in the shadows that looks less like a terrible closet monster and more like a common thug. Neither, of course, was anything like the traditional depiction of the Tooth Fairy and the Boogeyman. The unusual style of the painting really struck me, causing me to wonder about their story. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. I did. Me too. And really, all that matters is me. Yeah, I've noticed that. Welcome back, folks couple of announcements that we have to make. Uh, we did have a little trouble with our email address a couple weeks back. To the point where you had to actually change the email address, right? Well, the, or the server that the email address is on. Yes, I had to... God, it was such an... Un, you know, I'm, I'm really unexperienced with... Inexperienced with... Um, the unexperienced is even worse than inexperienced, <laughs> folks. I'm really inexperienced with any web 
type thing, so I have no idea what I'm doing whatsoever. And it was all trying to figure out frequently asked questions and whatnot. So our email went down completely for about 10 days. I believe it was the period of July 8th through the 18th. We didn't get any email. So if you, by chance, were one of the people who submitted a story during that time, you might want to resubmit that if you haven't done that already. But yeah, it was such a problem. I, I, I almost uh, went out and hired a web guy. Let's see, people would have to give donations right. for us to be able right. to afford yeah, we... to pay a, a web guy. So you, you ended up doing it yourself? Or? Well, I actually um, found uh, online there was a place where you could buy a droid. You can and, no, I'm serious, and it and it just takes care of uh, the stuff for you. Um, it was really cool. You pay a one-time fee, and then after that, the droid just wants to be plugged in and have you know energy and stuff. You have to feed it electricity, but you don't have to keep paying it, which is nice. So that is pretty cool. Yeah. Man. So we've got our droid. His name is R zero eight zero T, or you can call him R O eight O T. You know, whatever. So yeah, he's uh, he's on board. Why don't you say hi, O eight O T? Oh wow, he's right over there. Yeah. Has he been there the whole time? Yeah, he's, that's he's, funny because I, I conspicuous. I, yeah, he's, you, you, you look a lot like a trash can, and it's easy to uh, <laughs> be mistaken for one. But no, he's he's kind of a cute little thing. Check yeah. that out. Yeah, I like. Him. Hey, how how's how's my little robot? How you doing? Wait. What, what, do you understand what he says? Uh, yeah, I've, I've kind of learned what the oh, means. Oh, okay. So. Like, hi, hi, R-O-8-O-T, ro- robot. I'm, I'm Rish. How are you doing? <laughs> what? Wait, wait, what did he say? What is, what? Is, uh, you know, I, I'll have a talk with him later. Um, wait, wait, it was bad? What, no, no, tell me. I want to know. What did he say? Uh, so anyways, yeah, our email is back up. That email address, of course. The email address is submissions at dunesteef.com. D-U-N-E-S-T-E-E-F. Okay. Of course, if people have stories to submit. Submissions. Is if that what have, you just that's said? That's what I just said. Good yes. Lord. If anyone... I'm sorry. I'm still so distracted that, that we have... A... Now, can, can I give him, like, orders and tell him to do things Sure. And if stuff? you ask him to do things, tell him okay. to... I mean, he's, he's running the show. Dude, everything. this is the coolest thing. Uh, all right. Um... Oh, uh, just... 08 OT. Oh, 08 OT. Can you um, turn my microphone up, please? Did, did, he's not doing anything. Oh, 08 OT. Hello. Hello. I... Did, he, did he power down? Uh, no, I see the light on. I think he's... Okay, well, well, we'll come back okay, to yeah. it. All right. Anyways, yeah, so, and if you have a comment or a wonderful letter, a nice letter, a love letter you have to write to us, yeah, feel free to send that out. The address for that is editor at doonsteve.com. Yeah, you could also just leave a comment on the blog. We uh, have received a few comments now, and it's it's really wonderful to get some of those. Thank you, Mr. John Smith. Uh, what was that, a two, two, three, two, two crescent, three circle? crescent circle? Yeah. I appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate it. The heck, that yeah. robot over there appreciates you uh, posting to us. It, it's looking at me, Big. It, I don't think it has eyes. I'm going to be looking at you. I don't know. I just get the impression that it that it's judging me somehow. <laughs> do, you, do you feel that, too? When you walk in the room, you feel like, oh, that, that thing doesn't... But I don't have that problem. Huh. Uh, I guarantee you, he likes me. So he must like you. I, hey, uh, R08, do you like me? Do you like me? <laughs> that didn't sound like a positive sound. <laughs> Just, just pretend he's not there. I'll talk to him afterwards, and but, hey, I, just move on. I, I like robots. I, I, I never did anything to him. Okay, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, we'll, we'll sort this thing out off the air. Oh, the third thing is, once again, we are holding the microphone. <laughs> so if anyone can see it in their hearts, their non-robotic hearts, to send us a donation, we've got a PayPal link right there on the website, and uh, just. Push the PayPal thing and... Um, hey, robot, say I pressed the button. I pressed the button. Dang. How about that, huh? Did you program it to do that? Well, it's got some audio loop things. It's kind of like, you know how Wally has that deal on his shoulder where he That's pushes right. the button and it plays some songs? Uh, hey, uh, robot, cool, do you, huh? did you see Wally? See, now it's not answering. Hey, robot. Robot. Wally, it was a movie about a robot. Much cuter robot. 
Okay, never mind. Um, so, hey, donations, please, folks. So, it's been a couple of weeks since we were able to do the podcast. That's right. We were uh, on a long road trip. We headed out to San Diego for a little shindig called the Comic-Con. The San Diego Comic-Con? What is it called? Comic-Con International? They call it Comic-Con International, but that's kind of like saying... It's like saying vertically challenged. There you go. That's what it's like. I try to go to Comic-Con every summer. It's something I look forward to. And uh, luckily, I was able to uh, have company this time. That's right. Yeah. I was uh, able to get the missus to say, yes, you may go. Although I I don't know if she actually ever said that. I just kind of went anyway. I rang the doorbell. When she was distracted, he got in the car. We just peeled out and drove off. <laughs> we played the theme to the Dukes of Hazard. It was beautiful. Yeah, he honked the horn and it played Dixie. It was, you know, it had never done that before either. It always made horn noises. So. <laughs> Maybe that was the influence of that nasty little robot over there. <laughs> it's it's you, looking you, at me. <laughs> if you want him to like you, you're going to have to lay off. But what? Okay. All right. Sorry, kids and the little dogs and apparently robots. They just, nobody likes me. But I enjoy going to Comic-Con every year, even though... It's kind of like childbirth. They say that a woman, if she could remember the agony of childbirth, she would (laughs) never have a child again. But thankfully, she forgets. I tend to forget every single year how hot it is, how crowded it is, how bad people smell, how much of a pain everything is from lodging to parking to getting to the panels that you want to go to, to getting autographs, to peeing. (laughs) And I thought maybe we would talk a little bit about it. You and I were stuck in a car for, it had to have been 30 hours over the weekend. Yeah, something like that. um, Together. And so uh, I found out a little bit about you. Um, Sadly, found out a very little bit about me that time that I didn't have the shorts on. Um, Sorry, let me segue into what you want to talk about. Right, yeah, you you, you became accustomed to my uh, farting problem. (laughs) And, you know, now would be a good time for me to apologize because I I actually got quite mad on the 15th or 16th hour of our drive. But I'm not going to apologize because you could have rolled the window down yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, back to the subject. So, yes, uh, you know, I have to agree with you when you talk about just uh, that whole deal with the childbirth and just how much of a pain everything has become. You know, I went with you two years ago, didn't go with you last year, but went with you two years ago and then again this year. And I, gosh, I didn't remember all that problems. And I still don't remember it being that bad two years ago. Maybe there's 10,000 more people at the convention this time around. But a couple things that were serious drawbacks for me was, A, yeah, the crowds are immense. And because of that, sometimes you just plain can't get into the things that you came there to see you know you look at the list of all the things you can go to and you say okay that looks fun that looks fun that looks fun you try and go to those things and you just plain don't make it in unless you're there two hours before waiting in the line maybe they need to have simulcast of all the things so you can be in the room next door and see what's going on yeah i i don't have to be in the room with Hugh Jackman, but just being in the next room and knowing Hugh Jackman is here and getting to watch the clip that everybody else watches, because only a 1% of the people in there get to ask a question or right. get up there and get an autograph or something like that. It, and plus that, that huge Hall H fits like 15,000 people or something. I mean, it, yeah, I, it's I, a lot. I don't know. But and the big. fact that how many times we lined up and couldn't get in yeah. to Hall H. Just shows how overbooked that place we was. And missed the heroes panel because yeah, Hall the H blonde was, girl was there. Was full. Yeah, Claire Bear was there, and you did not get to see her <sighs> once first. again. And you know, one of my favorite new shows of this year is uh, Pushing Daisies. I got in line for that, and <laughs> one they put it in a small room. There was hundreds of people sitting outside waiting to get into that, and they just came along. Said, "If you're trying to get into Pushing Daisies, well, you're screwed." We hate you for it. And they flipped me the bird, and then they tried to kick me in the crock. I mean, do they really have to treat you that way? And from a senior citizen, too. That yeah, is, you don't expect that. The little old lady. We'll yeah. see if we help her across the street. Seriously. I wanted to interject. Uh, two years ago, I remember you did complain a great deal while we were there about things. 
But by the end of the drive, when we were going back, you're saying, next year, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to do this differently. So it was like, wow, he suffered through this stuff, but he's talking about what he wants to do next year, which is so cool. Um, I don't remember you saying, next year, we're going to do this yeah. on this trip. What I'm thinking more is like, next year, we need to find a convention that's smaller. San Diego Comic-Con is the big one. The big one. Keep out of mm-hmm. reach of children. It's the <laughs> every year people come from other countries and come from feet around to get there. And so what would you say was the best moment of Comic Con for you this year? You know, we're planning on talking about this next week, but I really enjoyed going to the panel about Doctor Horrible's sing along blog. But I think my favorite moment was when uh, the the film Doctor Horrible ended and all the cast and so forth came walking out everybody stood up they were all cheering you know standing ovation they went up to the front and waved their arms and whatnot and then they walked out and i think you were pretty upset about the fact that they didn't say anything to us but I yes I, I i believe the f word did slip <laughs> through my lips i thought it was great just to see them get their accolades yeah it's it's there's been very few times that something that i've made people have enjoyed and have cheered for and when that happens, wow, it feels good. I don't know. What was your favorite moment? Jeez, I'm coming up short, man. I had a good time, but boy, I, I was frustrated a lot of times. And yeah, it would have been neat to see all that stuff. That's the other thing that I'd like to complain about is this time around, they wouldn't sell passes to people for only Saturday to try and keep Saturday from becoming a complete madhouse. Oh, and it, it has been in the And past. yet... They still schedule everything that's worth seeing on a Saturday. Everything else, like some of the days, shoot, Sunday there's nothing, nothing whatsoever. Yeah, Sunday you could just not go, or you could yeah. just go I mean, and spend your money and not go to any panels if you wanted. I considered that afterwards on Saturday night, and I was thinking we should have not paid for the hotel for another night, just gone home. Yeah, one of the things that I think they've done to combat crowds, and you tell me if this is a good thing, is that they will program... A couple of panels that are going to attract a big audience at the same time. <laughs> so thus they split the potential audience in half. Yeah, it's... Unless, of course, you happen to be one of those people that would like to go to both panels. And I was. Yeah, that happened to me so many times. Saturday, all day long, I was like, well, I want to go to this, this, and this. I guess this one I want to go to the most. And then, of course, I'd go and get in line and wouldn't make it in. Because they also scheduled them all back to back to back, etc. So unless they happen to be in the same room, you're just playing out of luck. I even left Battlestar Galactica panel early, so you could go to so that pushing I could daisies. Go to pushing daisies, and all I did was wind up missing the end of the Battlestar Galactica panel. And you know that Battlestar Galactica panel was really, really fun. They had a, a big chunk of the cast. They had the creators there, and. Uh, the show is done. Yeah. They've, they've shot the last episode already, even though it won't air until you know 2041. Yeah, really what would you say then, conversely, was your unfavorite moment of Comic-Con? I don't know. I mean, I, I did wind up stuck in a few panels that I could care less about. But you got to rest your feet. That was a good part about it, but I really was not interested in Escape from Witch Mountain, the remake with The Rock in it. But what's her name? Uh, was it Carla Gugina? She's pretty good looking, <laughs> so it wasn't a complete loss. But yeah, who's going to be interested in going to that? I mean, they showed us the trailer, and the trailer looked like it was a movie for 16, 17, 18-year-olds. It should be aimed at kids because it was a kid's movie originally, but it looked too scary for kids i don't know maybe my kids are just wimpy i don't know what the deal is but i looked at that and i thought boy uh, let's see who's gonna want to go see that if i had to narrow it down to one thing it would be just being there in the main floor and you're trying to get somewhere with thousands and thousands of people jam-packed in this little space and the person in front of you stops walking i felt like getting a machete (laughs) out and just hacking my way through Temple of Doom style. It just, oh, it was one of those things where I understand if you're trying to take a picture or it's like, I'm lost or I'm looking for the girl. But people that just stop for no reason and then you have to stop and then the person behind you bumps into you or dry humps you or or you get shoved or, or whatever it was. And I know I'm just getting irritated about it, but it's just one of those things like L.A. traffic. 
where you're like, dude, there is no accident. Why are we stopped? <laughs> and Thursday, oh, we didn't really talk uh, about it. Right. We didn't get any sleep at all. Oh, we just yeah. drove through the night and drove to Comic-Con. And so by midday on Thursday, <laughs> I was so tired and so sweaty and smelly. And we'd been in the same clothes for 40 hours or something by this point. And I go out to feed the meter and there's a parking ticket on the car. Still not quite as bad as being on the show floor and having somebody stop in front of me, <laughs> but pretty bad. Yeah, that's that's a bit of a bummer. Donations, folks, please press <laughs> the PayPal button. Two years ago, I think, it had to have been the, the worst moment of all time when we came out of the show on Thursday and we could not remember where our car was. And we walked the entirety of downtown San Diego looking for that thing. <sighs> it was like 2.15 <laughs> in the morning or something when we yeah, finally we found finally the car. Found it. And it, uh, it wasn't our fault. We were parked like 1.8 miles away from the convention center. And we, we were just walking up and down the streets like a mile away thinking we couldn't possibly have parked farther than this. <laughs> and to remedy that, we would always write down where we were parked this trip. Yeah. And I did it last trip, too, because it just I would never want to repeat that. Yeah. I, in fact, dear listener, I wouldn't want you to have to experience that either. Write down where you parked. What were some of the best things that uh, you saw there that you would feel worth mentioning? The thing I most wanted to see was Joss Whedon's panel on Dollhouse. He's got a new show. It doesn't start till January, but they were doing a panel on it. And uh, we got into that, although how many hours early did we get there to do that? <laughs> we sat through Dean Koontz, right? Yeah, we sat through oh, Dean Oh, gosh, Koontz, his, his was... hairpiece. Imagine that William Shatner's hairpiece mated with a tribble. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. He's, he seemed like a nice guy. Yeah, he does seem like a nice guy. So we got there. We got to sit and watch the Dollhouse presentation. They didn't have a lot of footage or anything to show us, but uh, they just pretty much opened it to questions. And, uh, oh, yeah, I got to ask the last question, which was cool. I, I went up there, and I wanted to know something about the show rather than to let Joss know how great he was or... <laughs> Uh, I mean, he's great, but I think he knows. First of all, I'm a really big fan of all you guys. And then you have to tell what you're a big fan of. I really love Buffy, and I love True Calling, and I love you on Battlestar Galactica, Hilo. And then the audience applauds. And then you go on and say, I have a question. <laughs> it's like, why the hell have you stood in line for 40 minutes? Of course, of course you, you have, have a question. question. Anyhow, uh, I was up there, and... Uh, they ask you what your question is going to be in advance now because I guess there were too many people that says, can I hug you? Or it's like, Elijah, Will do you so sign my thing? And then everybody boos. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> At the Ghost Rider panel, the very first Comic-Con I went to, which would have been 2005, somebody asked Eva Mendez if she would take off her shirt. So I'm thinking maybe that's why. Maybe that's part of the reason why. why. why but anyway, be. okay, so they ask you what your question is going to be when you're three or four people from the front. And after I did that, the woman said, you, you will be the last question. And yeah, suddenly the pressure is on. It's like, oh, I better change my question. I remember your question was a little different when you'd gotten up and headed out there than what you actually asked. Was it really? I think it was something about when, when we were going to actually see it. Oh, yeah. I guess I was going to ask about the night that it was on. I went to the panel. They never said what night no, it was on. No, didn't. Or what time or anything. But, yeah, it was funny because uh, Eliza Dushku, um, really attractive. Yeah. So I started my question with, wow, you're even hotter in person than you are on TV. And Josh said, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that was cool. That, that felt good. Yeah, you I'm, wanted to ask her to take off her shirt, too, didn't you? No. I, well, that, that, shoot, where were you then? <laughs> Anyhow, I'm sorry. Uh, sadly, they did a signing immediately after that that we didn't know mm. about. And had we known, that would have been really, really cool. Yeah, I had my Firefly box set with me. <laughs> yeah, so did I. But, I mean, I have met Josh many, 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 many. Only three many, not four times in the past but you no in fact never... two years ago first comic con you went to joss was there signing for astonishing x-men <laughs> how long i left the line to go do this audition sat in the line for the audition went through the audition they did it twice i believe i was like when well, i try this switch it up a little bit i got through i filled out all the papers or the clearances or whatever came back 
You maybe had moved one person, Lance. I don't think I ever moved at all. Oh, well, I that was going to say because line, I yeah. had gotten out of the line. Oh, yeah. Well, there you have it. You know, you never got to meet Joss. I didn't even get close. And that's another thing that I I absolutely hate. And I know I'm focusing on the negative here. <laughs> but you got to, in these cases, when the people at a signing have a stack of things to be signed. And, uh, dude, I've seen people with a hand dolly. <laughs> of crap in a box and it's like anything Jim Lee has ever drawn I'm going to get him to sign six copies of everything that, that John Cassidy has ever done and these comic book people or actors or whoever it is that do these signings they're gracious enough to come and sign so they don't say hey dude that's not cool they sign 20 things for somebody but yeah 10 people back is somebody who's not going to get to meet Joss Whedon and I'm looking at him Okay. I've gone to so many signings where if they just said, hey, three items, folks, most people who just want to meet somebody that they admire are happy with one signature or he's like, okay, he signed my favorite book and he signed his poster or he signed, you know, whatever it is. And it's the people who plan on selling it right, later that have the 15 files. copies of X-Men 287 for Mark Silvestri to sign. Ugh. Anyhow, I, it's common courtesy. Yeah. Anyhow, I, give me something positive that we can focus on. What was something else that you saw that was really, really cool? I don't know. Did the, uh, did the rock do that thing with his eyebrow? He didn't. Oh. He well, didn't okay. Do now that is cool. Eyebrow. <laughs> this isn't really a good thing about Comic-Con, but I've already complained about how I didn't get to see the pushing daisies panel. But what I did do when I got home was jump online and search for it. And I found somebody who had recorded the entire thing, put it up for, as a podcast for people to listen to. And so I listened to, the Pushing Daisies panel, and... Uh, That's cool. Dude, Comic-Con.org should do that for every yeah. single one of the panels. Every panel should be there. Yeah, that's strange that they don't, because they're videotaping. They're, they're projecting it up on big monitors. Anyhow, one other thing that's cool about Comic-Con that we haven't talked about is all the free stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, you mentioned the that's Pushing Daisies, and it became our quest for the Holy Grail to get a Pushing Daisies bag for your woman. Yeah, that's right. And uh, something each day... special would happen if I brought... At least I thought something special would happen if I brought this Pushing Aww. Daisies bag home. But yeah, It's a rare insight into married life, folks. <laughs> each day we'd check back, see if we could get that Pushing Daisies. And not only was it a Pushing Daisy bag, on the other side it was Chuck, Chuck yeah. which is another of my wife's favorite shows. So I figured, gosh, a bag with both of those together. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, last year at at the Warner Brothers booth, they gave away these big Superman bags uh, that were made of cloth. And I have used that bag to go to the post office every single week since then. It's still good. I mean, it's just a great, great, well-made bag. So this year, each day, it was a different bag. There was a Wonder Woman animated series one. Oh, Nathan Fillion does the voice of Steve Trevor on that. Is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, One of the days, it was the Pushing Daisies thing. One of the days, it was Watchmen, I believe. Right, right. It was Watchmen. And so on Sunday, after failing for three days to get a Pushing Daisies bag, I, I, now, there was this rather attractive Cheryl Lee-looking girl that you were just trying to get the, the bag from. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and she's like, hey, she come on, you don't need that. I don't know. Yeah, she was just not budging. We failed on that. And then the last day on Sunday. I just happened to be walking past, and they were handing them out. And I don't even know. You know, I may have been one of those jerks that just pushed his way into I don't know where the line started. I just kind of climbed in there and... Managed to get through and get a bag, and there was probably only 10 of them left after wow. I went through, so I barely made it. Well, it was kismet then, and that person, 10 people down, didn't get one. Yeah. Took their life later on. <laughs> well, they weird. were probably getting their third bag anyway. Oh, seriously. Yeah. But, but in the past, the freebies, the swag as they say, has helped us pay for like the whole trip. They were giving out these these posters, full-size double-sided one sheets for this movie twilight the vampire love story where there's a girl that's in love with a vampire that's never been done that's coming out this december (laughs) and yeah they made you jump through some hoops They, they made you jump through the veritable ring of fire to get one of these posters but yeah people were i i can't remember how much people were asking for them on ebay yeah, if we could sell those suckers, uh, I guess I would have paid for gas for at least one day now. Yeah. But just having a little bit of cool free stuff to give away or to put on your wall or to put on your person. There were t-shirts we got and all that. It helps make the pain of the drive and the crowd and the expense a little bit softer. 
So we talked a little bit about the Pushing Daisies bag that I got, which I would say is probably the coolest thing that I came home with from the uh, Comic-Con. What was the coolest thing that you did get? You know what was really cool? Over the Paramount booth, they kept giving out random stuff, and you never knew what it was going to be. And there would always be a crowd, and they'd be fighting. Yeah. You know, It's just like, okay. I fought my way in to get a few things. And, uh, yeah, one of those times. Bloody noses, I think, a few times. They were handing things out that looked like lighters. Yeah. Cigarette lighters. And everybody's like, yeah. oh, give, give, give me my mind greed. Uh, so I sort of pushed my way through because I wanted to get G.I. Joe posters anyway. Uh-huh. Yeah, somebody slapped one of these lighter things into my hand, and then I slipped through. And yeah, I tried to be considerate and said, "Hey, I've already got one. If you guys will let me out, I've. If you guys will, if you, if you, people, they devolve, man. If that's a word, <laughs> it's they evolve, de- as you should well know. <laughs> well, something we'll talk about never. They de-evolve apparently into these savage cave beasts and you can't reason with them or say hey i already got it i i, I don't want to take stuff from you it's like raw meat mine and of course we'll cut out all of that <laughs> condemnation of the human race there when i got it in my hand and looked at it what it was was it was a flash drive one of those little portable hard drives with stark industries written on it like it's, the one that pepper had all the uh the stuff on dude i didn't even make the connection you're right yeah she used one of those yeah dang that's cool and it was in this little plastic case that didn't like snap shut but it had two little magnets to hold it shut it was ingenious man it was this perfect little cool thing and that was probably the coolest thing that right uh, of swag that i got so what did you do with that are you selling it on ebay or anything or are you just going to keep it i uh i lost it <laughs> <laughs> you lost it. I, I, I lost it. I, 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 for some reason, you'd always tell me, "Hey, do you know your backpack is open?" And I, I don't know how it always get open. Probably the guy behind you opening it up and taking but things. I from lost it. a He-Man sword, and I lost my sunglasses, and I lost like the cap to our poster tube, and I lost the flash drive, and, and who knows what else. So you lost all those things. I, I found the cure for the plague of the twentieth century, and I've lost it. Anyway. Well. Yeah. That happens. It's a good thing I've still got mine, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. So guess. anyhow, we, we went to Comic-Con. As, as awful as it was, I thought it was fun. You and I had a lot of laughs, and we got to talk about stuff, and we talked about this podcast a lot. We talked about writing, mm-hmm. and both of us did some writing while we yeah. were in lines or we were in panels. And any time I can do that, it's not a wasted trip. I wish we could have seen more. I wish we could have gotten more done or signed or experienced a little more. No parking ticket. No yeah. lost items. I wish we could have had free lodging. But, yeah. uh, you know, if wishes either. were fishes, we would uh, go to Skipper's less often. <clears throat> Thus concludes our rant. Our endless ranting about the show. And maybe we'll be back. Maybe we'll go to a different con. Maybe we'll go to one of those other conventions that everybody talks about on the other podcasts. I don't know. I want to go to one of those conventions where people dress in the animal costumes and then have sex. Um, what, what, are they, what do they call those? It's like furriers or f- I, I think or... it's a pervert convention. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think You uh, got me there. You were one of the founding members of that <laughs> convention, weren't you? <laughs> Okay, so thanks for listening, folks. Uh, we've had a good time, and uh, hopefully you did too. Are we still recording? We are recording, but, uh, you know, 080T will edit all that out. <laughs> yeah, he'll, because he'll edit out the stuff that makes you sound. I, I told him to, so he will. All right. Hey, folks, thank you for joining us. Thanks for submitting. You guys have a good night. That's right. Uh, uh, this has been Rich Outfield. And this is Big Anklevich assuring you that that could never happen with our behavioral inhibitors. It is impossible for me to harm, or by omission of action allow to be harmed, a human being. Good night, folks. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them.